The Aaron Calder Canal, it's one of the deep Yorkshire canals. It's not always deemed as being attractive. It's not always the venue that you think of, but what a fantastic piece of water. It's a massive canal stretching right through from west through south and into East Yorkshire. And trust me, it's full of fish. And today we've come for a little feeder session just to find out what is in this place. So this canal, which we call the Aaron Calder, some people call it the Nottingley to Gull Canal. Um, it's both Ferry Canal, there's lots of names for it. However, um, we call it the Aaron Calder and it's a massive stretch, but more importantly, it's not just one canal, it's a network and it links the New Junction Canal, which is the navigable part of the Don that allows access all the way from Gull into Sheffield, right up into Leeds and it's not far away from here where the Stainforth and Kidby Canal, which which is a little cutting that runs off this canal onto the new junction and then down uh, through Stainforth and into the Trent there. So we're surrounded by water. The River Don is running parallel with this canal and it's all part of a, a navigation system. And because of, of its size and its depth and its vastness and the fact that, I mean, the volume of water is absolutely incredible. It's teeming with fish, but it's long been ignored because we've had that much water nearby. I mean, you know, the Trent was always the place to go. The Stainforth Canal was the start of my sort of fishing locally, but this canal in recent times has become more and more popular and it hosts massive matches. And that's what brings me to the canal. We've recently had um, a, a feeder national uh, run by the Angling Trust that brought me to obviously fish this canal and I came a few weeks ago and on the first visit had a cracking day, seven kilo, 800 of roach, perch, small skimmers and an odd bream. So I wanted to bring Joe and myself back with the cameras to have a look at this brilliant canal and just have a feel for it. We've just bought a feeder rod because that's how we've been fishing leading up to this competition. Um, and although during that sort of practice matches that I've been, use, uh, been fishing, I've had to kind of get team points and fish for small fish. I know for a fact that there's a cracking head of bream and with a different style and more of a just a pleasure day, which is what I want to do today, and sit and fish for better fish. Let's have a look what we can catch from this, this brilliant canal. I know that there's loads of perch, loads of roach, loads of skimmers, but there's a massive head of bream. Matches have been won with over 100 pound on this canal. And, but it's an unusual place to fish. Uh, it's not your common garden, commercial it's certainly not a reservoir or a lake but look at it it's massive beautiful fishing so let's get on the seat box and uh and have a feel around and see what we can fish for bit of pruning because we're in a natural venue it's not commercial we've not got um the owner basically keeping everything nice and trim so i always carry a little saw with me just in case so we can just a few overhanging, which will make this edge a lot thicker because pruning is good for it. Farmers do it every winter. So just so we don't lose our uplands, basically. That we're uh, awakening more than I wanted this morning. I'd go to the gym if I needed that, but I don't. I do need it, but I don't want to. So, with bream and skimmers in mind, obviously, bait choice is obviously, it's, it's big. And just up from where we sat, oh, less than a mile, um, is Southfield Reservoir. Now, you'll have seen lots of footage and videos and, and we've been on there. And it's the same water. It's an, actually, it's a compensation expansion tank for this canal. And in there, strong fish meal works really well. Um, everywhere I go for bream, if I'm trying to select bream, I like a stronger mix. And Ferry Meadows, we did a video there, feeder fishing. Uh, that's a great video if you want to check that out. Big bream. We used Sono 50 50 method and paste green, which is this, this mix. And that is kind of the strongest fish meal that they do, and the ones that I like to use because it's nice and fine. But what I actually think about the strength of it is that it eliminates the smaller fish. So there's loads of roach and loads of perch. Um, 
skimmers will eat it, but it certainly seems to select the bigger fish. So that's the basis of what I'm going to feed. Then worms. Um, I'm going to chop some worms. But I'm not going to chop them too fine. So I also want to try and select the bigger fish. And then casters. Now, you've probably heard me say that I don't particularly like using casters unless I can put them on the hook. But when we do go selecting just bream, I like to put them in because I think they're a great grazing bait and a great holding bait. They hold fish on the bottom. If I'm trying to pick off a few skimmers and a bream, I don't really want casters in there because it's too distracting and I just want target baits. And then similar to casters, but because I think that a great hook bait, I'm also going to put in dead maggots. So it's quite simple. Um, on my side tray as well, I've got some fluoro baits. I've got it's mixed pinkies, but the most important part of them is, is fluorescent pinkies. Now, as I said, I've been fishing the canal recently and if I were trying to do well in a, in a match or a team match, I'd have two or three lines going. I'd probably fish at the bottom of the far shelf and I'd probably have a line down the middle and I'd probably want to use pinkies to make sure that I caught the smaller fish. I might even consider using a separate mix and, and I've been doing that, one that's not as strong so that I can catch small skimmers, roach and perch. But for the purposes of what I want to uh, try and do today is be more selective. And that's probably something you should just take away from um, today's session. That if, if you want to select certain types of fish, it's not about just giving them what they want. It's probably about putting the others off. So not giving the bait no, not giving the small fish the bait that they want. So a sweet mix, a cereal mix, would certainly attract roach and small skimmers. And you wouldn't be able to fish. And what I mean by that is that you wouldn't be able to leave a stationary bait in because it'd be, it'd be getting tips and taps. And then you'd have to put two dendrobinas on, for instance, or two bits of every corn. And that's not always effective. And, and I'm a big believer in the baits that you feed are the baits that you want on the hook. And... I like to be able to put maggots on or pieces of worm, just like we're feeding through the chop. So, um, you know, casters are great, but they're very difficult to know if they're still on the hook and they're not being smashed. So by just um, eliminating the small fish, it means that you can fish with the baits that you're feeding in a nice way, you get a nice clean hook hold because you've got, you haven't got a massive bait around that hook and you'll hook more bites and I believe catch more fish. So. Let's, um, let's get started, uh, we'll get plumbed up, find out where we're going to fish and, uh, and see how it goes. So trying to find the right spot for fishing is important and that's, that goes everywhere. Everywhere we fish, lakes, rivers and canals especially. So on this swim, I'm, it's a wide uh, sort of bay, it's on a big bend and immediately I'm, I can see that there's uh, weed and, and rushes on both sides. So that tells me that it's quite shallow, but I've started plumbing up and it's actually, a, the contours are a lot less defined than I expected. Because this is a deep shipping canal, sometimes the shelves are quite severe and you get a shelf on this side and a shelf on the other. And I don't think it's because it's a wide bend and silt's collected, but it's not particularly deep. And it's more of a slope away and a slope back. And I'm just plumbing up with this one ounce bomb and I found myself a nice spot, which is around, it's just over halfway, nearly two thirds. And that's a count of three seconds on this bomb, which in my mind is seven and a half, eight foot, could be eight and a half. It's, it's debatable. There's a thousand theories about how fast the bomb sinks. And, and I'm just gonna take a moment here to explain about that because I think everybody gets obsessed and scientific about it. It doesn't matter the exact depth. When you're fishing on your own, it's about the contours. So. It's taking two seconds for it to sink on the short line from about six meters all the way to about 15 meters. And then it goes down to about three seconds and that runs right through the middle of, middle of the canal. And then two thirds of the way over, it starts to come back up two and a half seconds and then three quarters of the way, it's two seconds. And then on the other side, it's really shallow. So regardless of the exact depth, whether that be eight foot, seven and a half foot, nine foot, it's the contour that goes like that and goes like that. So I'm just gonna fish on the far side of that very shallow definition of a shelf. I'm not calling it a shelf because it's not steep like that. Um, so the reason for that being is that I always think that the bream, which I think we look, that's what we're looking for, 
are going to sit just as in the safety of that sort of uh, bank, if you like, bank or shelf, but just slightly into the deeper water where they feel a little bit safer. They've got a little area to back off onto uh, when we start catching them and they can come back into the swim and back off. And that's my decisions for choosing where I, where I would fish. If I was, uh, I'm, I'm coming for a day's pleasure fishing here, just trying to catch some nice fish. I think if I were in a competition situation, I'd also look at fishing in exactly the same place, like a mirror opposite, on this side where it starts to come up, and I'd probably bait two swims to give me somewhere to rest. Uh, but because we want a nice simple day, I'm just gonna fish there. So plumbing up is really important, and just get it right for you and get the contours right in your mind so you can choose where to fish and learn from that if you make repeat visits to the same venue. So it gets talked about a lot. This is a one ounce bomb and I just count it in seconds. So as it hits the surface, I just stop it with my finger, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So that's three to three and a half seconds, which in my opinion, two and a half seconds a foot, sorry, two and a half foot a second, um, get your maths right Mick, that will put me at eight and a half foot. Not to be too precise, but as I said, contours are everything. Just count your seconds and see the differentials and that will map out the swim for you and just get it right so you know if you're fishing in the deepest or the shallowest or on the shelves. Really important, helps you catch more fish to understand where they live. I'm aware that there's lots of bream and skimmers, uh, there's lots of roach and stuff in here and perch and odd eels and everything, but the predominant species uh, which seem to be caught by pleasure anglers and match anglers alike are bream and skimmers. So I'm going to target them today. Uh, I think they'll be shoulder up in this nice wide area. Um, we're sat on a zone, so I can't see any reason why we won't catch a few fish. So I've got a strong fish mill ground bait, that's 50 uh, 50 green, uh, strong, very strong fish mill ground bait from Sawnew which I believe selects bigger fish. I'm going to add to that some chopped worms, which I've not chopped too finely because I want to try and attract uh, some better fish and not just little roach and skimmers. And I think if you just have a few bigger particles, unusually for me, but because I'm trying to catch some of the bigger fish, I'm going to put some casters in because I think they're a great holding bait and the same goes with dead maggots, some dead reds. So that's a fair amount of bait in that. And I'm going to sort of put three or four feeder fulls in at the start just to kick me off. Not too much because, as I said, I'm on my own and I'm just going to be able to fish them. I don't, I'm not fishing in any other swim. If I were trying to bait up a swim that I wanted to leave while I fish, let's say, a pole or another line, I'd probably put more bait in to give me enough food to last me. But because I'm going to be casting over the top, I can introduce feed as I go along. So that's what I'm just going to do and set off. So I've mixed that quite richly just in in the top of my ground bait. I've not, I've not mixed it through my ground bait because I want to just make sure that the particle amounts that I've put in, I can see and I get them all into my feeder. So we'll just kick that off. I've got a nice big feeder on. Just to get that in, and just dip my clip and try and, when you hit your clip, just have your rod over the top of your rod rest. And that just allows you to have a bit more accuracy because when you're fishing, You'll hit your clip like that and drop your feeder rod down in the same place. So when you're feeding, try and make sure that it's very, very easy when you cast, because it's a bigger feeder, you kind of hit the clip and it pulls your rod forward and you, and you stretch in. And then all of a sudden you're feeding your bait a metre at least past where you're going to be fishing. And that can be fatal because you want your bait to be either, um, so your, your hook bait just on the far edge or in the middle, certainly not this side of it. Because I always believe that the fish, you want to be picking them off the front um, or the middle of the bait. If you're um, trying to catch them this side of it, the chances are the fish will be set on the other side and just make life hard for you. So try to make sure that you put that bait in accurately and that should help you to catch a few more fish. So we'll just put a few of these in. You see, I've just got my rod rest over the top, my rod over the top of my rod rest. Like so, just let that settle. And because I'm trying to catch bream, I've given that a bit of a squeeze because I don't want it all coming out and attracting all little fish. There's roach, perch, rod, you name it, there's all sorts of fish in here. 
get down to the bottom. So I've squeezed it a little bit harder. So I'm just giving it a moment just to take a bit of water in so I can just get a little tug. And you'll notice that I don't strike it like a like Zorro. I'm just giving it a little shake because I think that that'll empty the feeder in a smaller area. Thus concentrating my fish where I want them. Because I'm fishing to a clip and that's because I'm fishing to that tight spot even on a short cast like this, that's only like 25 metres. It just helps with that accuracy. Hit the clip, look. Rod down, just like that. And just keep repeating that process and that'll just help you. And then later through the session, if I feel that I've caught a few fish and I'm, they've backed off, I can just actually land it with a reach. I can take a metre off my clip and just search around that baited area. And kind of, just because of experience, the amount of particles, casters, maggots and worms that I put in. There's just a few left there in that little pile of grammar that I've sort of blended them into and I'm gonna make sure they pull them because that's the amount of bait I wanted to put in. Some people like to measure it accurately. If you fishing in a team or if you're fishing in a place regularly it's not a bad idea to remember or make notes of exactly how much you put in and then you can compare it and see if that actually improves or um, works out to be a disadvantage then you know that oh last time i remember putting 100 mil of baiting or a quarter of a pint or a pint of bait whatever it may be and you can just take note of that, and that should help you build up a catalogue of information that you need to catch more fish. So I've not gone mad because I'm going to start fishing over the top of that because it's a one line day, nice and simple. So that looked like a liner. At first I was convinced it were on because it got that sort of telltale, more than a steady pull, which most liners are. It were more of a jolt, jolt, and then it started pulling in because I didn't dive in, because the late great Ivan Mark said, sit on your hands, I just waited and sure enough, it was a liner. So there's obviously something there that's quite early on. I've only just fed that bait. It's my first cast and we're six minutes into it because I just thought I'll be nice and patient, read my tip and sure enough, a line bite. We'll give that a little couple of minutes more and then um, probably have a recast because see if there's one there and. But it's a great sign, early signs, fantastic. Got all excited, because we've had definitely a few liners. That could have even been a liner, but it felt like I'd up to perch or something. There's definitely fish in the swim. That bait's not marked. And they're probably, it's quite coloured. Um, and when I got here, the canal were really pulling off. There were lots of movement on the water, weed beds floating down, some big, big um, barges come through here, some sand barges and gravel barges, and it might just be that the whole canal needs to settle down, but with all fishing, but especially bream and skimmers, they can be quite wary and they'll hover around and then all of a sudden they'll start feeding. But the fact that we're getting indications tells me that there's fish in the swim. And at some stage, if we just manage to swim properly, we'll start catching them. As always, patience can be paramount. And the last, the last cast, which I thought were on, and it must have, like what I call it, pricked itself. Because I actually think they've been quite flighty. Now, I've had a piece of worm on and I started on two maggots. And that's only been in less than a minute. And what I'd actually done is put three fluorescent pinkies on, which I know might seem strange for Breen, but 
my idea was that they're in the swim. Is it that they couldn't see the bait? And sometimes when fish are a bit flighty, as I call it, because they're up in the water, they're just dipping down into the swim onto your bait and grabbing something quite sharply and quickly and that last bite nearly pulled my rod in. It just made me feel that they're being a little bit flighty as I call it. Better get this cordial up. Um, he's well hooked, there he is. Now look at that, lovely, pristine. That's probably getting up for two pound, cracking fish. And that fell to three fluorescent pinkies. Now I've not fed any of them because for me that's a great hook bait and it's a brilliant sight hook bait. You can see that's what's left, look, there's two. They've gorged it. Interesting stuff and always just worth remembering that reading your tip and trying to, and I, I know that's easy for me to say because I spent a lot of time feeder fishing and Understanding what my tip's telling me is probably um, second nature with the last few years I've spent doing this constantly. But if you start to think about what your tip's doing and you get common reoccurrences in the movements that you get, that'll tell you what the fish are doing. A bit like when you're on a, a floor, you'll get little dibs and dabs and... You, you can read it, but you can do the same with the quiver tip. And I knew the fish were there. So I've just gone back in with the same up bait and see if we can catch another one. Strange things, you know, bream and skimmers, they, everybody thinks, oh, they just, once they're in your peg, you'll just keep pulling your rod round. They don't, it's not how they work. And, you know, just going deeper into that reading your tip. Even when you are getting bites, there's a little key to the type of bites that you get. And when there's a lot of skimmers feeding, or, you know, smaller bream of skimmers, when they're really down on the bait, your indications will be more subtle, three inch movements, two inch movements and sometimes and you see it rocking like that that's actually got your bait in its mouth and it's still feeding because they're dead confident they're on the bottom they're eating all your bait that tells me by the action of the bites and the indications what's happening when your bites are you get a little dink and then it, it pulls like that that usually means that the fish are up in the air they're diving grabbing your bait and swimming off because they're not comfortable when fish feed, they have to be comfortable. And if they're not comfortable, they'll be a little bit more jumping, a bit less confident, and they move a bit faster. And fast bites, and they'll pull your rod in. That, them pinkies are definitely the key here, look. That's incredible. And um, the bites will tell you exactly what the fish's behavior is. And by, using a bit of experience, it just told me that maybe they want to be able to see the bait. So I've just changed it up. And sure enough, two fish and two chucks. So from thinking that, oh, I'm getting a few indications, I'm not going to catch any fish, little fish. Probably, most people would think, well, oh, I've got bits in my peg. I'm, Bream will pull my rod round. They weren't. They were these things. These are what would give us indications. And what's not to love about catching good quality that's a similar similar fish actually might be a touch bigger that one and that could be deemed as a real small fish bait but it's not that's definitely bigger good solid fish you'll see them pink is just hanging out of his mouth there look what a cracking fish that is
So just a little rundown of the kit that we've been using here today and dead simple, I've got this is an 11 foot 4 um, ascension feeder rod, it's a nice soft rod, it's got enough power in the butt section to be able to cast uh, my bait up feeder which I'm going to use and then it will also have a soft enough tip and soft enough, soft enough action to play skimmers and bream. I've got that coupled with 020 five pound detection line that comes through to my basically go-to rig which is the free running rig I've shown this quite a lot um, but for the purposes of it just sits there I've got 250 mil length of the main line which is uh, I cast off the stock there up against the knot little loop to loop and a 300 mil hook length so you've got 550 mil in total which because international rules allow that seems to be a starting point for me it catches fish it's close enough the hook is close enough to the feeder to catch fish i can show it on this sort of competition but the match that i fished recently on here insists that it's a minimum of uh, 50 centimeters but if you're pleasure fishing and just fishing on your local venue or this particular venue just think about adjusting that you might want to fish up to a meter if the fish are on the drop and as you're falling through sometimes they'll intercept the bait and then if you're getting too many liners it's really worth shortening the hook length right down even i've even caught fish skimmers on sort of 10 and 12 inches as long as that away from the feeder because if the if you watch your tip and you're getting action around that pull your hook closer to your feeder by shortening the length and you will possibly find that that really works on certain days and off that that'll be my fishing feeder and that's just a five square smooth down 20 gram which will be enough to reach me across this canal but I'm going to start off you probably saw me baiting up with this solid feeder perfect for delivery and lots of particles because I can just squeeze it nice and gentle it won't get washed out on the way down which means I don't have to squeeze it too hard so when it hits the bottom I can just give it a little shake and empty out and create a swim and kick start the peg so dead simple rigs nice soft tip let's uh, let's move on well we've had a bite every single cast since we changed to them three pinkies the only change I've made is obviously I'd fed that because we're still really early on into the session I'd fed that sort of amount of particles at the beginning but because I know that there's a lot of fish there I've started putting as many particles in the same proportions, you know, a third casters, a third dead maggots and a third worms. And I'm ramming as many of them in as I can. I've even considered putting a bigger feeder on, but surprising when you look at what you've got in your side tray and in your, in your ground bait bowl, how much bait you're actually putting in and very little ground bait. And that, that's a better fish look because I, I know that there's enough fish there and they're eating all that bait. In fact, that's a cracking bream. Um, I want to make sure I hold, that's a bit bigger than I thought it were, um, hold the show. I mean, look at that. That's got them three pinkies stuck in its, in its lip there. You'd, you wouldn't think that that a fish of that size, that's three plus, could even that could even go four pound because that's a young healthy fish really strong thick set fish and it just goes to prove to you that you can never stop trying things you've got to sort of I think they used to call it ringing the changes but educated guess as well I would call it because it's definitely made a massive difference and I'm going to catch a couple more because I'm really enjoying it. But then what I'm going to do, and you'll probably do this yourself, I'm going to stick a different bait on in a little while. Um, I can't help catching a few first though, but um, just to prove that. So that, as I spoke about earlier, I mean, I'm ramming, that is almost neat protein, um, maggots, casters and worms. Just to see and prove to myself that it is actually that what's made the difference, the hook bait, or whether it was just the fact that they decided to feed. And for building up experience and building up your fishing sort of acumen and 
and knowledge, a library of knowledge, by changing it up and not just sitting there and catching one every cast in, as tempting as that may be, um, you'll then understand, ah, it wasn't the bait, it's just that they just decided to start feeding. But I'm pretty convinced it will. But let's, we'll try that in a moment and see how we get on. So, interesting, the last sort of half an hour or so, because we had an amazing run that started pretty much after we'd initially fed it, and um, and then all of a sudden it was like turning the switch off, and the fish stopped feeding. So I went through the obvious, you know, up bait chains like I discussed, and um, no bite, it's an odd little indication, but then we talk about reading the tip for signs of fish. Another thing that you can use your tip for, I mean, that's beautiful fish on here, is um, what's happening with the canal itself, with the water. And then it become apparent, I'd, and obviously not clocked it, that the toad stopped. So when I, when I said this morning that when we got it, the canal were running really hard, it was towing and two things have happened. It stopped towing and the colours started to drop out of it. And I think what happens with fish is when, when the water's moving, and that's the locks that are working on the canal, I mean, we're not far downstream is Gould Ox and Gould then runs into the Humber. So this canal, I think it's the Humber, it might be the Trent or the Hills or both because that's what the Humber is. but. Um, anyway, it runs into the sea down here and basically they were running it off or some boats were coming through some locks and the canal was moving. It's then stopped and I think when the canal's moving like it is, that encourages the fish to have to swim a bit harder. And I always feel that when they're moving, they start to feed a little bit more. It makes them a little bit more active, I think. And um, and that's probably what we'd got in that initial good run of fish. And then when it stops moving, the fish then kind of don't have to swim and they don't have to try. And I think that they come off bottom. They kind of lift up. And because we were getting an odd indication like we were at the beginning and no bites. So I thought, what I tried to do was cut out, you know, I said I was feeding a lot of bait, putting a lot of particles through. My first reaction was to feed some soft ground bait. So I just filled my cage feeder with just ground bait and hardly, hardly squeezed it to try and draw them fish down. So it's a bit of that ground bait's coming off mid water and hopefully the fish follow it down to the bottom. Because I don't want to start or sort of keep plowing maggots, casters and worms in because if the fish are then only up in the air and they're dipping down I don't really want all the fish sorry, all that bait on the bottom and it not be able to sort of single out my up bait but that's a fine line in between not feeding anything and losing the fish and actually catching them on a ratio um, you know, of, of cast to feed to to return bites and fish. Anyway, not really successful, so I went through a bit of a spell of not catching a lot, and then I started up in the feed again. And what I think's actually happened is the fish have settled and they've got used to the fact that it's not moving as much, and, and they've come back in. They are a slightly smaller stamp. It started off with a couple of small skimmers, I and mean, that one will be a pound and a half, but. Um, the magic up bait is still that bright fluorescent three pinkies. You see that hanging out its mouth up. And um, so, I mean, look at that bait. You can even see it from there. And so it's just interesting that, oh, the fish have gone. I don't think they'd gone at all. I think they'd just come off the bottom. 
and there are a few tricks like I said you can feed sometimes you can feed sloppy ground bait um, and that will create a bit of a cloud a bit of a an interest for them fish to that are swimming around off the bottom it'll gather them and draw them down to where your focus of your feed is but it's a little trick but ultimately you've got to be careful with that in the same token because feeder fishing involves one of these things and that's got a big lump of lead on the side of it which means it sinks to the bottom so really the last thing you want is to be encouraging fish to be off bottom so wherever you can although it's great to put an odd you know soft one as we call it or some cloud in you are in danger of driving the fish crazy and all they'll do is sit up in the air swimming around in that lovely cloud of bait and they'll not go down and feed you've got to nail them to the bottom because that's where you feed it and your up bait's going to be and obviously while i've been talking to you about what's been happening we've just had another one and so that's two and two and i think we've just had four or five fish in four or five casts so you know it's good that these fish have come back so it's been a really interesting session where we've had a couple of spells where it's been black with fish but the one thing that's been sort of definite is that up bait and i know i keep banging on about it but i think that's the one thing that I believe is the key to catching fish is working out what the fish want. And it's not always obvious and it's not always the same. So you've got to be open-minded. And that sight hook bait, as I'm calling it, because I believe that's what made the difference, the, um, that's been so effective. And I've just... Had a little spell where it was a little bit quiet so I put the big feeder back on that I fed with initially and put a bit of bait in because I'm not 100% certain I mean these fish are quite the fit the young they're quite aggressive and I mean you've seen it when we've been fishing and talking and you chuck back in you get another one and it's kind of on my mind that they've eaten all the bait so I've just put a bit of a impact of worms, casters and maggots in just to try and keep them feeding. And it's it's an interesting thing whether you feed or not, whether you keep plowing baiting. And I touched on it earlier that it's a fine line because you can sometimes put too much bait in and then the fish become hard to catch and you get too many liners and and you have to settle your peg down again. And it and it's hard it's sometimes hard to read it. So I'll just try and remember that keep a little track on what, what what you're doing and how you're doing it and the response you get and don't be frightened of being quite sort of positive in in your changes you know fill your feeder do that two or three times see what the response is because fish are, are very reactive and that were a lovely bite um fish are very reactive and they will let you know if you're doing it the wrong way so you've got to change it up sometimes and change what you're doing. Now, that bait, that bait's actually brought a, a run of perching, which is an odd thing. But that usually tells me that the skimmers and bream have backed off a little bit. But we'll keep pushing on and we'll keep putting bait in because if, you know, and that, this is a great example that if we've got a load of small fish in this peg like that, that are eating that, and they're quite greedy little devils, a, a perch, they'll mop all that worm, cast and maggot up, and they won't be any when the skimmers and bream rock, rock back up. So don't be frightened of putting it in, because as I say, you'll soon find out if you're doing it wrong, because your peg will change. Your reactions will be different, what you get back from it. So... I'm going to keep pushing this in and see if them fish come back for us. Just had a period where all I could catch were perch and I've even had a couple of Tommy Ruff and I have a bit of a 
theory on Tommy Ruff, you only catch them when there's no bream there. They don't live under the shadows of bream swimming over their heads. Anyway, I've plugged along and kept putting a bit of bait, and I actually went through a spell because I thought the fish were shallow. I had a big line bite as my feeder went in, and I just fed big feederfuls and neat ground bait, hoping to do what I was talking about earlier, which is draw some fish down. And, uh, and that didn't seem to work, so I've gone back to feeding and putting bait in and, you know, worms, casters and, and dead maggots. And perseverance has paid off. I've stuck with that up bait, because despite trying worms and double maggot, I've even tried caster. None of it seems to have worked, but the faithful, successful bait of today the fluorescent bunch has paid off once again and that is probably equally the second biggest fish of the day and it's a great fish to finish off on and it just goes to show you that working through things and being patient and that run of fish that you can catch when they decide to feed means that trying different methods and working through the changes and reading your peg, reading your bites, reading your tip will pay dividends and I've had a cracking day here and it just goes to prove that I know it's not a small narrow canal but it's a canal and what a great day's feeder fishing that's been so if you like these feeder fishing videos there's plenty more on our channel Please subscribe and like and watch some of our videos and join us next time for another great session.